Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday, September 15th. Um, if you're like me and having a hard time remembering what day or date it is, <laughs> um, welcome to the second of our live roundtable conversations um, as part of the Another Day With You campaign. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Katie Mumper. Um, I am the Director of Communication here at To Write Love on Her Arms. Um, and it is my honor to host uh, this conversation today. This is a last minute change. So <laughs> uh, doing a little spontaneity um, at the moment, but um, ready to be a part of this conversation um, with some awesome guests. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, um, last week was National Suicide Prevention Week and World Suicide Prevention Day was on September 10th. Um, and the uh, Another Day With You campaign is our annual campaign um, around suicide prevention. Um, and so we, every year, this is our 10th year, we create a statement that we rally people behind to be able to share hope, to have conversations, um, to move people from hopelessness to help, and um, to help to raise funds for um, treatment and recovery to help people um, be able to stay for another day. Um, so, um, as I said, National Suicide Prevention Week, last week, World Suicide Prevention Day on Friday, um, but the conversation doesn't end there. Um, we are still um, having the conversation because it's important. It's not limited to a day or a week. Um, September is also National Suicide Prevention Month. Um, so we are continuing to have these conversations through the end of September, but also at To Write Love, these are conversations that we have year round um, because it's important to share hope. It's important to remind people that they aren't alone. Um, it's important to ask about what they need um, and how we can help support them. Um, and so that's, what we're, what we're doing. Um, we're going to continue to share stories on our blog and on our podcast. Um, we are doing a mini series for this campaign. Uh, there are three episodes out already. Um, you can find those on our website or anywhere where you get your uh, podcasts. Um, and then um, on our blog as well, we've been sharing stories of lived experience um, from people as well as on the podcast um, around suicide ideation, um, suicide loss um, and even suicide attempts, um, just wanting to remind people that they aren't alone and um, that it's important for us to have these conversations and to talk about suicide. Um, so all of those conversations are happening. We're continuing to have some conversations and some posts on social media. And then, like I said, there's this, this round table conversation today, and then we will have um, one last one next week as well, um, focusing on the stories that we tell around suicide. Um, so because the conversation is continuing, because the campaign isn't over yet, uh, you can still purchase your WSPD pack. Um, it's still available. You can still use the shirt, the cards, the sticky notes, everything that comes with that pack um, in order to share hope and to have these important conversations. Um, we know um, that the shirt is not limited to a day or a week. Um, you can wear it as often as you want to share hope with yourself, to share hope with the people around you um, as well. Um, and then the other part of our campaign every year is fundraising. And um, for the World Suicide Prevention Day campaign, um, this year, the Another Day With You campaign, all of the funds that are raised go directly to um, treatment and recovery. So we are working hard to um, help people get access to the mental health support that they need. Um, our goal this year was $250,000. Um, we've raised over $260,000, which is awesome and incredible. Um, so we have surpassed our goal, um, but we want to help as many people as possible. Um, to be able to access that mental health support that they need and deserve. Um, so in order to do that, we are continuing um, to keep the campaign open in terms of the fundraising as well. You can continue to fundraise. Um, you can start fundraising if you haven't already. Uh, there's still a couple weeks left um, and you can still donate um, through the end of September. So um, links for the campaign, links to purchase the pack, links to purchase um, or to fundraise or donate. Those are all in the comments. Um, thanks to our amazing uh, Kayla on our team. Um, 
so those are all um, things that are still happening, like I said, through the end of September with this campaign. Um, we also have some pretty amazing friends who have signed a few different jerseys um, and you can actually make a donation and enter to win one of those jerseys um, as a way of supporting the campaign as well. Um, so we have uh, two very limited edition <laughs> uh, Tuloha jerseys that were created specifically for the campaign. Um, one is signed by Ashlyn Harris. One is signed by Jess Bowen. Um, and so you can enter to win either one of those. Um, we also have uh, Orlando Pride jerseys, um, one signed by Allie Krieger and one signed by Alex Morgan. Those are both also options. Um, and then we have a U.S. Women's National Team jersey that was signed by Tobin Heath as well. Um, so there's a link in the comments as well. You can still make a donation um, on that page specifically. It's separate from our main um, fundraising campaign, but all of the money um, donated for the Jersey raffle will be going to the Another Day With You campaign. Um, so you can do that through 11.59 p.m. Eastern time <laughs> on Friday. Um, so you have a little more than two days left um, to be able to do that. Um, again, there's a link in the comments um, to be able to uh, get all the information on that and um, choose a jersey or multiple jerseys you can enter to win multiple um, however you want to do that but we are so grateful to our friends um, Ashlyn and Allie and Tobin and Alex and Jess for helping to um, support the campaign in that way so um, one other thing that I just wanted to mention um, so today we are focusing on the idea of how we can help other people um, but we are going to be talking about um, suicide and suicide prevention and so if that conversation gets heavy for you. Um, if it's too difficult to listen to, feel free to step away if you need to. Um, come back and rewatch later. This um, recording of this conversation will remain on Facebook and be available for you to watch whenever you um, are able to do that. Um, so just know that it's okay to take care of yourself in these moments if, um, if that's needed. Um, I think that is all of the housekeeping. Um, I do have three fantastic guests to bring on and join our conversation today. Um, so let me get them added here. Um, all right, so we have Dr. Dion Metzger, Scout Silverstein and Andrew Pilkington. Um, I'm going to let them all introduce themselves. Um, so Dr. Metzger, we will start with you. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Dion Metzger. I'm a board certified psychiatrist here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my specialties include working with eating disorders, um, women's health, and also I spend a lot of time treating symptoms of depression and anxiety. Uh, suicide prevention is actually something very dear to my heart that I've been working with in terms of building awareness for probably over 10 years now. And I'm just really excited to be here. We're excited to have you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Scout, you're next. Hi, everyone. I'm Scout. I use they, them pronouns. I identify as trans, queer, white, and disabled. Um, if you need a visual description, I'm sitting in front of a gray wall wearing a black shirt. I have clear glasses um, and my hair is kind of swiped over to the side. Um, I do work also in eating disorders um, at the nexus of policy, training. I do academic research and some case management. And I'm part of a collective called Fed Up. Uh, it stands for Fighting Eating Disorders in Underrepresented Populations. We are a trans and intersex collective. Um, so if you're watching and you yourself are trans or intersex and struggling with an eating disorder or you know someone who is, we offer free peer support groups every week. And we also have a Facebook support group that you can join. Um, and Andrew. Hi, um, I'm in the I'm in the producer and I am I have several problems um one my but and I um in my free um um but yeah um yeah good to be here. We're glad to have you. Um, and Andrew, you were a part of a movie, yes, called Best Summer Ever, I yeah. believe. <laughs> um, 
I was the writer and producer of that movie, which is a musical. A lot of people disagree, and it's on Hulu right now if you want to go watch it. Yeah, so check that out on Hulu if you haven't already. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but it's on my list. Um, mostly because I'm a fan of musicals, so I'm very excited to <laughs> be able to watch that. Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and jump into our conversation. Um, so I have a number of questions um, that I am planning to ask um, our guests, but if you, those of you who are watching, if you have questions as we um, enter into this conversation, feel free to put those in the comments um, and we can uh, pass those along um, to our guests as we have time. Um, and yeah. So um, also I will say for our guests, I didn't mention this before we came on the air, but um, in terms of responding, this uh, free for all, um, feel free to hop in if you have an answer. Um, no need to raise hands or anything like, <laughs> like that, not a school situation, but. Um, so um, one of the things that we talk about um, and part of the reason why the fundraising portion of the campaign is something that we do every year um, is that we know that having access to mental health support is a part of suicide prevention. Um, people need to be able to have um, that support to be able to talk to someone, to share what they're going through, um, to not have to carry whatever pain it is that they're experiencing alone. Um, but we also know that accessing that help isn't always easy. Um, so I wanted to throw it to all of you in terms of um, what you see, what you've experienced um, in terms of what barriers to help exist in the world. Um, and then if you want to elaborate a little bit on that as well, um, perhaps talking about why you feel those um, barriers exist. Who do you want to go first? Does it matter? Doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I think accessibility is definitely a huge barrier, right? So being able to find, like you can reach the point where you're like, okay, I need help with this. This is too yeah. hard. But it, the next step of being able to find somebody to talk to is just really difficult right now. And I, you know, and friends and family who are struggling with symptoms, that's always the biggest barrier is just being able to find somebody. And it's finding somebody who has under their insurance or finding somebody that's nearby. One good thing about what's happened over the past year and a half was that we've been able to have more therapists available virtually. Yeah. So that has definitely opened it up across the state. But I'd say accessibility has been one of the major, major hurdles because just think about it, having the strength to even decide that you're ready for therapy takes a lot and then meeting the person takes a lot. So you want to make that process as smooth as possible in terms of being able to finally have a session with a therapist. Uh, the reason why it exists, I, I just don't, I think we need more. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a numbers game too. Um, and we need more in terms of the different communities. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting a therapist who may also be trans or also be a person of color or also a woman. And sometimes when we want that specific um, kind of therapist that we're looking for, the numbers are lower. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, especially when we're looking from the, their perspective of wanting a specific type of therapist, we just don't have the numbers. And that, that's been a barrier. Yeah. I could jump off of that point, actually. <laughs> um, so when I was thinking about the question, I my first two thoughts were financial barriers, mm -hmm. um, especially for people enrolled in public insurance like Medicare, Medicaid or TRICARE, um, as well as just places that provide treatment lacking cultural sensitivity. And um, there is absolutely, I agree, nothing wrong. It actually makes a lot of sense to look for a provider who has shared identities. Um, but there is the other side of this question is why are there not a lot of black therapists or black mm -hmm. dietitians or trans therapists or trans dietitians and unfortunately, the same reason that there's financial barriers, um, a lot of treatment centers are for-profit companies, getting into academia, um, being able to manage academia while you're experiencing a lot of minority stress. There's a lot of barriers in terms of a lack of mentorship for people who have non-dominant identities who are trying to provide help. So if we can't even provide help and get credentialed, then I can imagine how hard it is. And I've also been there in trying to access help that didn't cause more harm. 
Um, and of course, once you go into a medical or mental health environment and you experience harm, you're going to be less likely to return and exactly. ask for help again. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunately a cycle then of, yeah, all of that. Um, Andrew, did you have anything you wanted to add to? Um, yeah, like, and, and, um, lack of but my own put on I know people who got school to become a victim like I put on and it's incredibly expensive to not a lot of help when it comes to mental stuff like that. the financial barrier both on the end of being able to access it but also the financial barrier of being able to go and get trained and become a doctor or whatever and being able to have that access as well um that's farther upstream in the system but all part of that system and in, in creating that barrier um to help um so with that in mind where could we don't really like to use the word should, <laughs> um, but where would you like us uh, to be focusing our attention when it comes to eliminating some of those barriers that we've talked about? What what are some um, kind of initial uh, areas or, or things to, this is to start really, I guess, <laughs> is the question. I would say first and foremost, when engaging in cultural humility training as healthcare professionals, ensuring that that training is provided by people with lived experience or of the culture that is being talked about. A lot of the time, the reason why these systems can be harmful is they're offered through this lens of Eurocentrism or white supremacy. I know that's a big scary term for people, but it's just the way that our medical industrial complex has been built. So it's to start undoing those harms and start making treatment environments that are safer and more accessible for people. We need to kind of like flip it on its head um, mm -hmm. and make sure that the people who have the lived experience are leading these trainings um, and then also I find a lot of value in partnerships. So like I've done a live before with To Write Love on Her Arms. Um, there's organizations like Project Heal that provide treatment assistance by partnering with treatment facilities. So they're able to scholarship people who might not otherwise have the financial means to get help. Um, and then there's organizations like Black Therapist Rock or the Queer and Trans Therapists of Color Network that can help both people seeking help connect to therapists that have shared identity and also help people find a mentor that works in the same field and build their skill sets in their area of focus. Yeah, those are great. I agree. I think, you know, just being able to give those resources. And the thing is that I notice is really helpful is providing those institutions, like providing those links to these places like Black Therapist Rock. So, you know, th those things where people can go to an actual website or mm -hmm. be able to access what they need to. Um, I know a lot of times there's a lot of um, there's a lot of people who are trying to build the directories so people can mm -hmm. go to one place and be able to find yep. something under what they need. I mm -hmm. think the more we streamline that, like just like looking for a restaurant, if you want to look for Chinese food, you can see it lists all the options yep. that are listed. I think if we can make it as streamlined as, as possible, that would be the biggest help. And especially for a generation where things are so accessible through apps and everything, you know, it's kind of old school to really ask somebody to call therapists on the phone <laughs> one by one to see who picks up. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's just not realistic to think about that happening in 2021. So giving links for resources and making it as accessible as possible. Because like I said, first of all, the decision to go into therapy is a big one. And mm -hmm. it's scary. You know, a lot of people have anxiety right before meeting their therapist and having that first session. So we really don't want to build any hurdles between those two things happening. Yep. 
Yeah, and that's our find help tool exists as, a, as you talked about building directories is literally what we're doing. Right. <laughs> um, but figuring out how to do that and the majority of the resources that are listed on on our find help tool are um, available for free or for reduced cost. But people can also filter and figure out, you know, um, depending on um, whatever <laughs> personal um, yeah. aspects of what is what it is you're dealing with, um, what you're struggling with, all of the various identities that can exist um, and being able to try and find somebody who is going to be a, a good match um, for that because we know that is such a big part of finding the right person. Um, and then on once that's happened, <laughs> but there's also um, the treatment and recovery scholarship, which helps with being able to provide some of that financial support to actually make it possible to, okay, I have found a counselor, but mm -hmm. how do I actually pay to go and see them? Um, and so between the two of those things, hoping to try and help to eliminate some of those barriers in that way, um, which is super important. And as Scout mentioned, also working, you know, some of that is people, individuals applying for those scholarships, but it's also us working with the providers, with the counselors, with the treatment centers to say, hey, this money is available, connect us to the people who need it um, and can benefit from having it as well. Um, Andrew, did you have any thoughts on that front as well and where, where to focus our attention? Um, I mean, I would say um, that we um, um, support is such a huge yeah. part of it and you know we we get sick days <laughs> um mental health days maybe um as well or that it's okay to use your sick days for mental health days um and time off to be able to go to counseling um like you know because who has time to do it <laughs> um outside of work hours and you know all of those sorts of things there's so many things that are yeah. happening in in our lives um to which i think um Dr. Metzger, you were mentioning earlier with the pandemic that a whole lot more of like the telehealth is happening, which does have a little bit more flexibility. Yes. With some of those so things, that's so. really been an advantage where people are getting more comfortable with having virtual visits. Mm -hmm. And then also you're able to access, you know, therapists across the state. And that's, yeah. I mean, I've seen it even in my own practice where before I'm in the Atlanta area, usually I'd see people who live within probably a 30 mile radius, but now I can see people all the way, you know, from Atlanta all the way down to Savannah, which is at the very bottom of Georgia. So uh, that has been really a blessing where people are now more open to the idea of virtual therapy because there's some people who weren't even the idea of having a virtual visit just did not seem personal enough for mm -hmm. them or they thought that would affect the connection but now that we almost had that only option yeah. it made people really explore it and see the benefits of it and stuck with it yeah yeah i mean i i lived in atlanta for a period of time and you can't go anywhere without it being at least a 20 minute drive <laughs> so, and every, everywhere is 20 minutes away yeah exactly so mm -hmm. if you're you know if you have to take that time off of work for the session but then also the time to get there and the time to get back that makes it even Absolutely. more difficult so mm -hmm. um so kind of shifting gears a little bit um and 
wanting to make sure that as we're talking about this, we're looking at the bigger picture of, um, you know, mental health support obviously is a huge part of suicide prevention, but we know that risk factors for suicide include things that don't necessarily fall under what we would call mental health. Um, so things like unemployment, bullying, financial crisis, trauma, um, serious physical conditions, all of those are considered to be risk factors for suicide. Um, so in order to make suicide prevention inclusive of that aspect, um, what kinds of support um, can should exist, do exist, um, to help to alleviate those risk factors and maybe get us to a point of not even being um, in a crisis moment to begin with, if that makes sense. This is so hard. Um, I know I have some statistics to share personally, but I think this question is really relevant to the discussion around the Met Gala, if people have been looking at it, where AOC were a dress that said tax the rich and there were protesters outside who were arrested who were talking about black and brown communities being more prone to being unhoused, unemployed, living in poverty, and they were shut down um, and of course detained. And there's like all this like this could be suicide prevention to tackle these things, but nobody's investing in communities who are actually in need. So like my personal take is we need to redistribute wealth. Like I mentioned earlier, people, especially on Medicare, Medicaid and TRICARE, there's access to some support, but that support is very shoestring. Um, a lot of times it feels like a holding cell, not like you're actually receiving mm -hmm. high quality therapy. And that's not the fault of the therapist that works there because they're probably only getting paid mm -hmm. half of what they should be getting paid. And they're managing a caseload of 20 patients instead of something more appropriate like six or eight. Um, so again, I don't have like a straightforward answer mm -hmm. aside from I think our system needs to be turned over on its head and built from the ground up again. Yeah. And I definitely agree. I mean, I've had the 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 expertise of working from like community state hospitals. Um, I did community psychiatry, literally getting in a van and going to see patients in their homes who weren't able to who didn't have the resources to do that through a community treatment team up until private practice and kind of working in a private hospital environment. So I've really been able to see psychiatry in all its different forms. Um, and it, it, it's unfortunate, but in, in, it's just not prioritized like on Medicaid and Medicare and even some private insurances. Like um, the reason why even in my private practice, I can be honest, is that I, I there are certain insurances I couldn't take anymore. And just because they don't reimburse us as psychiatrists as compared to if I was another specialty, um, you know, if I was an ENT and I was having a visit or a neurologist. And so you, it's from the top <laughs> what's going yeah. on. It's not that us as psychiatrists are saying we just want only cash practices. It's literally because we're just not being compensated for our time. And that just kind of shows you the priority that, you know, the administrators are, are putting mental health um, how low the priority is. And so, but that's, that's the pretty unfortunate part about it. And I will just say that I know sometimes the rates for therapists out of pocket or psychiatrists out of pocket can seem exorbitant. Um, it took me until I was working within the field to realize how emotionally laborious this work is. Like we want to be there for clients. That's why we're doing it. At the same time, when your clients are in crisis, oftentimes, like you take that you absorb some of that yourself Absolutely. because you care. So like Dr. Metzger said, like, it's not, we don't want to help certain people. It's that we want to help certain people and we want to survive ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Understandable <laughs> um, yeah. and needed. And, you know, yeah. And it, it again, the, it's kind of the, again, zooming out and looking more at the systems that are in play as opposed to just the, what is it that you're experiencing in the moment um, and or on an individual level and how do we continue to address those things? How do we turn the system upside down, dismantle it completely, <laughs> rebuild it um, and, and be able to make sure that people aren't potentially winding up in these, um, situations where they're facing unemployment or they're facing mm -hmm. um, financial crisis. I mean, I'm looking at this list and going, okay, so the, uh, this last year, then it makes sense in terms of, you know, I, we didn't necessarily see 
the number of completed suicides go up, but we did see the number of attempts and the number of people thinking about it increase. Mm -hmm. um, and the, I mean, a lot of those risk factors are right there and just built into what we've been going through in the last year um, as a country. And then obviously, um, and you may have answered this already, but just to create a little bit of space to talk a little bit more, um, I know Scout, um, you have some thoughts and some stats on this as well, but that the fact that our systems exist in a way that puts people with certain identities at more risk for experiencing those risk factors for not being able to access the support that they need. Um, so maybe on a practical level, <laughs> um, however deep you want to go into that, um, how do we dismantle those systems? How do we turn them upside down? Um, and what can we do while we're in the process of that to help support people who need it now, if that makes sense? Yeah, first, I realized that what I said just before may have been off-putting to someone who's seeking help. So I just wanted to emphasize that um, there's no harm in emailing or reaching out to a therapist that you think may be a good fit and asking if they have sliding scale spots or scholarship opportunities or utilizing resources like To Write Love on Her Arms um, that offers treatment assistance. There's, it's, there's duality there. Um, in terms of what we can actually do, I think some of it comes from within the field. Um, I know in eating disorders, we have a working group in terms of divesting from harmful institutions that do have a lot of gatekeeping involved in terms of getting credentialed. Um, for example, there is a black dietitian who was trying to get certified through IADEP and there were no black supervisors. So as a whole, we're trying to shift away from that organization and create our own systems of care, our own collectives where we can offer training and supervision to one another. Um, and then specifically to what you asked, like what can we do to lower these statistics? I will say that for trans people, there's a survey that's put out every five years or so at a national level and 40% of people reported um, experiencing a suicide attempt and 65% reported suicidal ideation. Um, there is a survey called the FAT Census that was put out by the Data Futurism Project and Hunter Shackelford, and it showed about 80% of fat people reported suicidal ideation. Um, trans people with eating disorders, around 75% reported either suicide attempts, self-injury, or ideation. So when I think about it like that, I'm like, well, what happens when you have a Black, fat, trans person? Because that means their rate of suicide ideation or like the likelihood is going to be just under 100% when you put together all of those factors. The two great things about this, well, not about this, but that you can do, um, trans people with strong family support are 82% less likely to attempt suicide. And that strong family support can be an extended relative. It does not need to be from the nuclear family. So like for me, it's my grandmother who I love dearly and is a really strong ally. And then um, using someone's pronouns, their chosen name, um, giving them proper social support, access to gender affirming care, all decrease um, suicide ideation by 66% and um, suicide attempts by 76%. So that is like a really great statistic that just goes to show that give someone the medical care they deserve, treat them with respect, dignity, and integrity, and you're likely to move them out of crisis and into a space where they'll feel safer to engage in working through whatever struggles that they're experiencing. Yeah, we um, we have a, a phrase that we use a lot at Try Love in Our Arms that people need other people um, and the idea of community and how important that is. And I think, um, you know, obviously we've been talking about systems and things that we need to do to change systems and that can feel overwhelming and daunting, but also being able to know that like literally just showing up for somebody and having a conversation and like you said, providing that dignity um, and um, and support through conversation and being present um, and supportive of them is such a huge part of providing that help um, as well. So um Andrew, I wanted to give you a chance to chime in if you had any other th any thoughts on systems and what we need to do to fix them <laughs> or change them completely. Um, that's not, that's an easy question. It's um, not an easy question. 
support again that we were you know it comes back to that as a starting point i think that's a, a good place for all of us to be able to start scout to do if that's yeah i really like what andrew said and agree i think something i haven't spoken about that much aside from alluding to fed up offering peer support groups is that community support with the right boundaries and a careful approach can be the most radical environment to heal in you're engaging with people who have shared identities or shared values. There's less of a hierarchy in terms of um, clinician versus client. And in my experience, there's room for more vulnerability. So like we have this free support group at FedUp for trans or intersex people who are struggling with relationship to food or body. Fireweed Collective, which used to be known as the Icarus Project, also offers free or sliding scale peer support groups. Um, if anybody who's watching this needs access um, to a list of peer support groups, you're welcome to reach out to me and I could get you, so. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we talk a lot about sitting one-on-one -on -one with a therapist and that's great and can help people, but there are other forms of therapy and other forms of support as well and that, that peer support, the like literal reminder <laughs> that you're not alone and that there are other people who um, have similar experiences and understand um, what you're going through in some level um, is so important. Um, so um, statistics are showing that um, while overall suicide rates in the United States have been decreasing, um, if you actually disaggregate <laughs> that data um, and look at it by um, race and ethnicity, that that's not the case for people who are not white. Um, so people of color, those numbers have actually been increasing. Um, and so with that in mind, um, how can we be thinking about um, changes that maybe need to be made in terms of suicide prevention, um, the conversation, what does that look like um, to A, acknowledge the, that reality and B, making sure that we are providing the support, listening to, 
the people who are most affected, et cetera, um, to make sure that suicide prevention is actually reaching the people who need it, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it's a statistic that a lot of people actually aren't aware of that, mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing such a rise in the people of color and, and suicidality and not only the ideations, but completed attempts. Um, it's, you know, I think the years of 2020 and 2021 were especially rough. Um, especially with a lot of, you know, the racial injustices, the police brutality, all of that being really brought to light and the trauma of seeing somebody who looks like us be treated this way. You know, that is a traumatic experience. So I, I, th I think that is, it's, it's taken its toll. And then when you combine that with the lack of access, and also there's a cultural aspect to it too, that, you know, as people of color, when we are dealing with something where it's either depression or symptoms of anxiety, it's more of a, we were taught to push through it and, or pray it out where, you know, you mm -hmm. lean towards relying on your own strength or, you know, relying to, or, or going to church. And I'm totally, I'm totally a, I'm a Christian and believe in that, but I also say God made psychiatrists too, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So um, I think, you know, these resources, it doesn't, we're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. So a lot of times people think that you have to do one or the other. And I said, no, no, this is all part of it. And I, I always try to normalize it when I'm doing anything where I'm kind of bringing more awareness is just like, if you had an ear infection, would you hesitate to go to the doctor and get an antibiotic? I need you to start treating your mental health like you do your physical health, where if there's something hurting you, and just because it's mental does not mean that it's less important, we should go ahead and seek treatment. So, you know, I do a lot of awareness and especially living in a city of practicing in a city like Atlanta, where we do have, you know, a larger black population, but we also have a larger black professional population that have the means to do some of this, whereas in other cities, we may not be able to see that, is that this is a national problem. This is, this is something where, you know, culturally, we have kind of been taught to push through this. And, and, you know, even psychiatry is not considered kind of on the same level as other specialties, although we all went to medical school. So that's just stigma. And that's just cultural. And, and it's something that I really give a lot of applause to the generation right now, the millennial generation. I know some of them hate being called that. But <laughs> I had to give a lot of props to that because we are talking about mental health and, mm -hmm. you know, athletes and, and hip hop artists and, and people are talking about their struggles and that is way more effective and has way more influence on our young people sometimes than, you know, them hearing it from a psychiatrist doing like a public service announcement. So, um, yeah, so that I, I'm, I'm not surprised to see that statistic go up, especially yeah. over the last year and a half that we have had. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was to be expected, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I think too, and this jumps a little bit into what our topic next week will be with the stories that we tell around suicide. But I think, you know, from my perspective of being responsible for the stories that we are telling uh, to I love, making sure that we are intentional in sharing a diverse range of stories so that people are able to look at suicide prevention or conversations around eating disorders or whatever and seeing someone who looks like them. We have a blog um, on our blog um, that I think the title is even, I thought white uh, therapy was only for white people. Mm -hmm. um, and so oh, like, I've heard that many times. Yes. So literally growing up with that perspective, which makes it you know, going back to the very beginning of the conversation yeah. makes it that much more difficult to be in a place to say, I need help and it's okay for me to access help. Um, so maybe Or simply the thought that therapy is a luxury. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so being able to share those stories so that other people know like, okay, I'm not alone in that experience. I'm not alone in feeling like it's not okay to access therapy um, or I'm not alone in having these thoughts and struggling with feeling like I'm supposed to be this strong person and this means that I'm not a strong person. And then, right. you know, being able to, to uh, shift those perspectives a little bit um, more. And focusing so. on that actually being a sign of strength, you mm -hmm. know, being able to say, listen, I'm not feeling well, I'm going to do something about it and reach out to somebody or have the strength to tell somebody about it. Like, yep. listen, I'm not feeling myself. Um, what can I do? Yeah. Yeah. So being cognizant of who the storytellers are that we are presenting to people, um, I think is important. Um, all right, so 
now that we've talked a lot <laughs> about all of the barriers, uh, well, not even all of them, but uh, barriers that exist, um, we do want this to be somewhat actionable. And I know we've touched on it a little bit, but um, if you could give the people who are watching um, two, I have two in my question, but it can be one depending on what, what you're thinking. Um, but if you could give us two action steps that something that we could do today um, to help support increasing access to mental health, what does that look like? What would those be? Um, I could jump in. So this may not be approaching it from a systemic level, but I've lost many people to suicide over the years, especially having grown up in group homes. Um, there's a lot of risk factors among my peer group. And now I just, anytime I think of someone, I text them and let them know I'm thinking of them and I love them. I think a lot of times our lives start moving really fast and um, we don't think that we need to do that, but you never know whether or not you could be saving someone's life or giving them a buoy to pull them in when they're drifting away. Um, and then I think like I have a bunch of theoretical answers that aren't as direct, like offer to help workshop someone's resume so that they have eventual access to financial capital or so that they can become a therapist. Um, and then the millennial generation was just mentioned. Um, I think asking people for money can sometimes be fraught um, and is kind of loaded since especially younger people don't typically have access to financial capital, but even just reposting um, flyers or infographics that talk about mental health or mental health support can reach someone who may not otherwise see it. And also just like taking the risk of being vulnerable. When I'm vulnerable with someone else, it doesn't feel great for me immediately, but they end up being vulnerable with me in return. And it creates this type of relationship that ends up being stronger and we're able to be supports for one another. And I really value that. Thank you, Scout. Uh, I, I always like to emphasize the power of the are you okay text to people. Um, you know, there's sometimes that we might see loved ones or coworkers or friends that they're just not like themselves. And there's so much power in literally just asking the open ended question. Are you OK? Um, sometimes we kind of hesitate to ask people these questions because we don't want to impose. But you don't know the power of that, that when you are dealing with something and somebody picks up on it. And it's sometimes that really opens the floodgates in terms of them being able to express what's been going on. Uh, so. First of all, that's the first thing. Like, so if you notice somebody's off and people have different ways of expressing it. Sometimes people even use social media as a way to express their mm -hmm. frustrations. And you may notice like their stories are just kind of a little bit more different or what they're talking about. But social media can also be a cry for help very often. So pay attention to to things that are, seem a little bit off and reaching out to somebody and, and asking if they're okay and sharing. Um, you know, the one thing is we talk a lot about the negatives of social media, but there's the positives in terms of messages yeah. going like wildfire. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you see something that you think is promoting mental health awareness, share it, share it, share it. Like um, you don't have to be a psychiatrist. You don't have to work in the mental health field to promote the awareness of it. So just using the power of social media to, to really share, repost those images, repost those slides anything that you see, um, because that has become the new phone book, right? So that is not, you know, that's how people are access to information is through hashtags and Instagram and TikTok. So really using that, that um, those platforms to, to distribute as much information that really center around mental health awareness. Yeah. Andrew, thoughts? Well, um, yeah. Probably. I would say from a public standpoint, I would encourage you to reach out to your local officials or you know, government and say, oh, what these things are to you. And your community. Um, you know, I, I always say the building is the best way to voice your opinion. So, you know, 
the more the more the more the more the more the the yeah, we, um, so last week for National Suicide Prevention Week, we did an, shared an action step each day, and those are still on the um, website at tuloha.com slash WSPD. Um, the last day we talked about how do we continue to have hope um, grow and continue to be a movement. Um, and part of that was using your vote and um, the idea of um, every election is an important election, regardless of who we are electing, um, and that your local community is a super important place to get involved, to know about who is in leadership and what they are prioritizing and how can you use your vote to say, you know, these are the things that we need to support and, um, and do better in um, or do differently. So um, thank you for that reminder, Andrew. That's a definitely a, a place to be able to start as well. Do some research, find out what's happening in your local community um, in terms of mental health. So I also appreciate Andrew mentioning policy since that's one of my strong spots. Um, and this is just to say that anyone who is able to vote can also work with a legislator on introducing new legislation. Mm -hmm. So if you have an idea from a public health or public policy perspective, on what we can do to increase access to treatment, whether that's for suicidal ideation, for eating disorders, for trauma. Um, you can talk with your senator, your assembly person, your local city council person, and come up with a plan for how to get that passed at the local city or state level. Um, okay, so one more question before we wrap up, um, but, if someone is struggling to remain hopeful because they are experiencing some barrier to access to the help that they need, um, what is one thing that you would say to them um, to let them know that they can get through this? I don't, I, I'm not entirely sure how to word that question in a way that doesn't then lead us into toxic positivity, but what, mm -hmm. what would you say to someone to give them hope in that, that moment if they're needing that? I always say there's help available um, because a big part of the hopelessness is thinking that this is not, not going to get better. Mm -hmm. So just knowing that there's help available, um, it's something really simple, but the knowledge of that can really have quite an impact. Yeah. Scout or Andrew, thoughts? I don't have anything poetic to say. I think like it gets better frustrates me because like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm like, how am I supposed to believe that if I'm in the trenches still? Mm -hmm. um, but I think something with a little more empathy tied to it, like I've been there mm -hmm. and now I'm in a place where like my life is full and I'm able to access a broad range of emotions can potentially help someone reach out when they are in crisis um, because they trust my experience. And also the very straightforward question of how can I support you? Um, someone may not have the answer to that, but they may think of some things that can at least alleviate right. what they're experiencing. Even something as simple as helping them find a therapist or mm -hmm. you just going through the list together, I found is really, really helpful for to show support. Like, okay, it's like, because you're formulating a plan, mm -hmm. which is future oriented. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it doesn't get better if you don't help well. Yeah. You can all you want. You don't get better. You don't get better. So, have a little plan, invest in a new plan, and, you know, people help
way to execute the plan. So, you know, I'm ready to spend the time in that room. So, like, you know, I do it. I know I'm going to invest just a lot of time in the helping group. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah, we um so on our find help tool and we talk about this sometimes with folks is um you can actually like save a list of resources. So if you do have a friend who's struggling or for even for yourself to be able to go back and reference those later. We've even um talked about um going back to what you said, Dr. Metzger, about helping them find a therapist, but also if you're not feeling comfortable with going, if you're going physically <laughs> to a session, being able to go with them and just mm -hmm. say, you know, I'm going to sit in the waiting room while you have the conversation, but that way I'm here with you. Just um, a presence. I'll get you there. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I will be here when you're done. Um, knowing that those conversations can be tough and difficult and, and being able to be some space and uh, presence to be able to, to help with that, um, that process. So, mm -hmm. Um, all right. Well, we are nearing the end of our time. So I wanted to give everyone um, the opportunity to just share a little bit. Um, anything else you would like to add to the conversation or make sure that we all uh, leave this conversation with that thought um, as the last word. Um, let us know where we can follow your work or get in touch with you. Um, and then if you would like to, um, we're asking, as part of the campaign this year, we're asking everyone to share their response to this statement. I want another day with, fill in the blank, with whatever you would like to share. So um, I'll let you go in whatever order you would like to. <laughs> uh, well, uh, to find me, um, my my handle is Dion Metzger MD, and that's across everything, um, including TikTok, uh, Twitter, and as well as Instagram. Um, and just like I'm always posting stuff about mental health awareness, and yeah, I, I just kind of reach out to me on e any of those. I'm I'm pretty responsive. Um, my website is DionMetzgerMD.com, and also. Um, for anybody who's in Georgia and wants to be seen, my um, my website for my practice is drmetzger.com. Um, so sometimes even if you reach out to me and you're having difficulty finding somebody, you know, just reach out anyway. If I'm able to do it, I might I want to help with giving resources, which I often do. And I don't know what I want another day with. Um, I'm going to... I. I'm a little bit stumped, so I'm going to let Scout go first and, <laughs> with answering that, and then I'm going to give my answer. Okay. <laughs> we'll allow it. Okay. Cool. Um, so my last word, I just wanted to say thank you to the other panelists. Um, Dr. Metzger, I love that you're on TikTok. I'm not even there yet. Um, <laughs> and Andrew, you have that. such an infectious smile and laugh. <laughs> I love just like sharing virtual space with you. Oh, wonderful. Um, yeah. In terms of how people can follow my work, Fed Up Collective at um, on Instagram, I think all platforms, um, and our website is also Fed Up Collective. And if you want to connect specifically with me, just DM us and I'll see it and get back to you. And then I want another day with community. Ooh. Nice. Andrew, what's your last word? Uh, um, I don't um, I felt I'm underqualified to support you, but I feel even more underqualified. And you feel that I am Dr. Metzger, I'm me. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, I'm on Instagram, Ruby, and Twitter. Oh, I'm the Google man. I'm not that hard to find. Um, and that if you want to get some songs that you have to get out that someone will who will um um I think it's on a little bottle and 
And if you ever want to talk like a movie, I love meeting people. So, you know, hit me up. And uh, I want another day with all my family and friends and yeah, people I love. Thank you so much. Love that. I want also, another day with laughter. I got perfect. one. Perfect. Love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we love another day with laughter. I would like another day with musical songs stuck in my head because they're, <laughs> they're often, my brain likes to think in musical lyrics. Um, usually I'm, I wind up quoting Hamilton, but it just depends on the day. Um, so, um, well, thank you all again for your time and your energy and sharing that with us um, today and um, giving us a lot of things to think about. Um, so hopefully for all of you watching, you're able to leave this conversation with something that you can do today um, to help support someone else in their healing or even maybe a, a next thing for you to do for your own healing. Um, and uh, we, um, like I said, tuloha.com um, is our website, T-W-L-O-H-A.com. Um, our Find Help tool is available on there if you do need to get connected to local resources. Um, and you can also find out about our treatment and recovery scholarships on there as well. Um, so that is everything. Thank you um, for watching. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of the conversation. Um, and we're just so grateful to have the opportunity to be able to have these conversations um, and do what we can to continue to change the numbers um, around suicide. So goodbye, everyone.